what if we could love them all and let God sort it out? If you've ever wondered how to make a real difference in the world, then do we have the Love Anyway show for you. Today I'll be talking with Jeremy Courtney, one of the world's true heroes and the epitome of an open-hearted warrior, the founder and CEO of Preemptive Love, a relief and job creation community working to end war, and the author of one of the most powerful, life-changing, I'm speaking personally here, and must-read books, Love Anyway. So welcome to the show, Jeremy. Are you ready to shine? Thanks for having me. So happy to be here. What did 911 mean to you? 911 meant to me so many things. And, and frankly, it meant one thing uh, when it happened and kind of in its immediate aftermath and in some ways means something different to me this many years on looking back. I think at the time it meant um, it meant fear. It meant uh, being under attack. It yeah. meant in a very personal way and in a very ethnocentric way um, where I, I only knew how to relate to the event itself mm -hmm. through the lens of my, my group, my people, um, without any kind of greater context in the world for, for the backstory or the, the context in which these attacks were being carried out. Um, but I guess chiefly it meant, uh, that it, it catalyzed me. It launched me into adulthood in many ways. It was the threshold of, you know, kind of crossing out of emerging adulthood, adolescence into young married life. And, um, it was one of those traumatizing life defining moments at, at that fragile point of transition. In the war zones, former war zones, and everywhere that you've traveled, you've seen people able to do triple flips. They're one way to begin with, then they flip to another, then they flip to a third, maybe even they flip beyond that, because we are all capable of change, particularly if when given love. I've heard it said, and this rings very true from my life experience, I'm 40 now, um, that the only thing that ever changes us is great pain and great, great love. And I guess it, it feels worth noting here that it's not just love that changes us. Sometimes pain changes us. Um, I guess the problem of pain is that it can change us in one of two directions. It can somehow send us back into a more of, of a regressive posture and send us backwards, or it can catapult us forward uh, through that that membrane, through that that field or that that threshold that we're on and like really push us into a whole new place that we've never yet been. Yeah. So, so yes, I've seen great human pain and really societal communal pain push some of us forward and send some of us backward to a, what might feel like a safer place, a more familiar place because we've been there before. And so we go back to the place that, that feels comfortable to us. Um, but I think that's the great work of my life. That's the great work of our organization and what we're exploring constantly is what is the, the potential packed in every moment of pain, in every moment of love to, to push us forward. Thank you. When you started on this journey, there was a Pastor Davidson involved. You ended up in Turkey and you had quite a different mission at that time. What was the mission and maybe what was even the lie, I'll put that in quotes, that you told people while you were there? In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, I think as a young man in the South, um, spiritually and, and religiously fervent, devout, mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to make sense of the pain. We were trying to make sense of our fear. We were trying to make sense of the story that we were hearing and the story that we were reifying in some ways that we were under attack yeah. and they were out to get us. And in an effort to make sense of that and to cope for ourselves and our national trauma, uh, a group of us set out into the world to make things right in many ways. And, and we fancied ourselves as being drastically different from the soldiers who went out from our same neighborhoods to make things right. I, I say that in air quotes. Yeah. Um, 
while some of us grabbed our guns and went out to kill them all and let God sort it out or, or bomb them back to the Stone Age, mm-hmm. um, I was more of a community of people who grabbed our, not our guns, but we grabbed our Bibles to go out into the world and, and make things right, um, set things to rights, not in a overtly or uh, what it was not apparent to us that we were seeking any kind of retribution mm-hmm. or, or seeking any kind of dominance or power over others. We, again, we fancied ourselves as having taken a very different path than the, the military types. Mm-hmm. So I landed in Turkey um, as a missionary at once trying to heal the wounds of 9-11 and bring Muslims to a more loving, enlightened place, and at once trying to work out my own trauma and my own pain and trying to perhaps solidify my place in this world by showing the the, the dominance of my worldview and the, the inherent truth, you know, of, of the way I was and the way I saw things. And it wasn't until I had lived a number of years as a missionary, really fighting with my neighbors every step along the way, finding a way to, to turn the kindest of hospitality into a, a theological debate and argument in which I would, you know, wrestle someone into submission it wasn't until I had done that for years that I really realized the aggression in me Mm -hmm. and realized that, that I was, I was seeking to dominate my neighbors just like, you know, maybe my military friends were seeking to dominate Muslims in the wake of nine 11. Yeah. You, you asked earlier about the lie that we told people the lie, (laughs) there were lies. Um, we, we had such an essentialist view that Muslims were, um, you know, essentially at their core, evil, wrong, depraved, debased, and and therefore they could not be trusted with the truth. They could not be trusted that they we were the good faith people there to just talk about eternity and what happens when we die and what is the way of righteousness. That because they couldn't be trusted, we had to lie to them. And so we we had any number of ways that we said one thing and did another from a very complicated pure place in our hearts you know <laughs> we, it, it's easy to look back now and and paint a kind of caricature yeah. of who we were at that time but but i've learned to be gentle with that guy uh who was Thank 25 you. years old um because i think it actually was true it actually mm-hmm. was sincere and i i appreciate the ways For whatever harm I also did as that guy, I appreciate the ways in which that guy carried me on his arrogant shoulders to to who I am today and where I am today. And so so, yeah, we did seek by all means possible to get in, stay in and essentially make sure there were no Muslims by making them into Christians. But. But thankfully, in the context of real friendship and relationship and what ended up being a a profound spiritual experience and spiritual awakening, I I stumbled into a a higher way, I think. Can you share about that? Because as I understand it, I don't know if you were down on your knees screaming or praying or pleading or begging. What happened? Yeah, to all of that. (laughs) So I had gone to a... um, a sort of covert missionary conference where we were meeting underground in secret, yeah. discussing how we could be more effective in, uh, you know, somehow eradicating Islam, essentially. At least that was my intention in going. And what I found at the actual heart of the conference was was a different way of thinking, a different way of talking, a, a real honor and regard for Islam, unlike anything I had ever seen, a real honor and a regard for Muslims in their personhood that, that was higher and deeper than anything I had ever seen. And I just felt very confused and conflicted as my, my heart was being asked to expand into a place that I had never yet known. And those kinds of 
crackings or breakings can be very confusing and traumatizing. And so I, I was on the ground crying out. They had like scheduled a sort of like, now go pray about this or meditate <laughs> on this kind of moment. And um, we were to to break off on our own and, you know, seek the wisdom of God. And I, I find myself down on my face praying, crying out to God in a kind of jealous rage, you know, that these these weird missionaries that I've now find myself among, I feel like they've moved the goalpost. Uh, they're not even talking about the same thing I'm talking about. They're not even wanting the same goal of like getting rid of the Muslims, getting rid of Islam. They're actually somehow embracing Islam mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. Like what kind of weird syncretism is this? Yeah. And in calling out, to probably myself and God in prayer, you know, working out my own ego and, and calling out to God in prayer. I think maybe for the first time in my whole life, I heard a response from mm -hmm. the deep, from on high. Uh, and the response was, I, I was crying out, why aren't you doing anything through me, God, essentially to, to eradicate Islam? Why aren't you making me the most efficient emissary of eradicating Islam on the planet. And the response was, because you don't love them, Jeremy. And that simple phrase, whether it was from within me or from without, uh, it, it changed me instantly. I saw myself in my mind's eye with my fists up, looking for a fight everywhere I went. I, I recalled in a moment all the kind-hearted people, Muslims across this land who had opened their hearts and their homes to me, and they had just wanted to welcome me at their table and give me food and dessert and kindness. And how I had managed to turn almost every one of those acts of kindness into a fight, a theological debate. They would affirm the, the oneness of God or the love of God, and that would not be enough for me. I would I would need to go to our points of difference. They would affirm that they were in fact followers of Jesus and that would not be enough for me. I would have to tell them that they actually misunderstood Jesus altogether. And in every instance, no matter how much we shared in common, I knew how to turn it into a fight and focus on what little we didn't share in common. And for the first time laying down on the floor, face down in prayer, I, I really saw myself for the conqueror that I was for the, the fighter in the most negative sense that I was. I had thought that I was so different from the militant type, but I was militant. And um, when that word came, you don't love them, Jeremy, I actually saw myself lower my fists in my mind's eye and open up into a posture of embrace, which is incidentally a vulnerable posture. Oh yeah. Um, the, the, the posture of having your arms open wide to someone makes it difficult to, to protect yourself. And, I was changed at a heart level, at a, at a life level in that moment. I stood up off the ground in prayer and I was completely transformed, never to go back to that previous way of being or stage of life again. There's a concept, and it's a book we're writing now called The Open Hearted Warrior, which is shields down, heart forward, standing mm. in the heart, leaning into fear. That's what you became. It's strange to use, but it's such a, a young, aggressive term, but a worry of peace in this case. Standing forward in a vulnerable stance. In fact, I think you took the ultimate stand not too long after that. What in the world made you visit Iraq? A growing awareness that um, y you know, some of us come up through a very rational um kind of scientific way of thinking that essentially aims to flatten the inner life. Mm -hmm. Everything is external. Everything is biological in its essence. There is no mystery. There is no uh, spiritual essence of the thing. Consciousness was, is made by the enzymes. Yes. Yes. That was not my experience. Mm -hmm. My experience was actually the opposite. Uh, sort of everything is spirit. Mm -hmm. Everything is aimed toward eternity, mm -hmm. and all that matters is whether your soul is saved from shame, sin, hellfire, damnation, and 
nothing else matters. The body doesn't matter. This world doesn't matter. Therefore, social systems and economics and politics and policies and none of that really matters. All that matters is that our soul escape this sinful body and be at peace with God via Jesus forever. And so what I was waking up to in these early missionary years was was how flat that view of the world was. Mm -hmm. I was seeing poverty in my streets and let me help your soul escape your body was not a sufficient answer. Yeah. Um, I was, we were living through various forms of terrorism and we were contemplating ethnic cleansing and there was war in Iraq on, you know, in our neighboring country and the soul escaping the body into eternity forever didn't seem a, a fulsome enough response for mm-hmm. the actual people I was knowing now in my life. And I think as I, I began to contemplate whether my spirituality and my theological framework was enough, uh, I just kind of kept tumbling inexorably down that hole, down that hill, ultimately asking questions about war and violence and humanitarianism and uh, caring for the poor and putting our bodies on the line uh, to lift others up. And within about a year or two, um, we had concluded that we wanted to move into the Iraq war, not just read about it in the newspaper headlines. It was going badly off the rails. The American interventionist project had had been grossly ill-conceived and ill-executed. And naively, we believe that um, our hearts were expanding in such a way that we could make a difference in some of the darkest days on our planet at that time. And so we naively moved into Iraq, into the height of the Iraq war, believing that we could help end it. Wow, 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 wow. What were the people like when you got there? And what was the... It, it kind of jumps ahead, but you kind of had a, a Tolstoy moment, shall we say, that came up. What was going on and what were you feeling as you're assimilating into, I don't know any other way to call it, we'll call it a new norm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, a, there's an old proverb um, about this old man's sitting on, by a tree on the side of the road and a traveler comes by and says, hey, old man, this village up ahead, what are the people like there and the old man sitting by the tree says well what what were the people like in the last village that you just passed through and he said oh they were they were selfish and they were greedy and they didn't open their homes to me at all and they just made me pass through and that's why i'm asking what this village up ahead is like and the old man sitting under the tree said yeah it's it's pretty much the same way in the village up ahead and 30 minutes later another traveler comes by on the road and asks the old man hey brother, what's the, what's the village up ahead like? And the travel on the road says, oh, uh, the old man says, what was, what was the people like in the last town you passed through? And he said, oh, they were so beautiful, so wonderful. They opened their homes to me and were so kind and so gracious. And the old man said, yeah, the village up ahead is, is just like that. Um, we, we get what we're looking for in this world in Thank so you. many ways. And, you know, I, I was not the person that I had been, mm-hmm. but I certainly wasn't yet fully some new person that I was becoming. You know, I had I had laid down some of my bigotry, I had relinquished some of my fear, yeah. but I'd never lived in Iraq. I'd never lived among Arabs, who, as all Americans know, are the really bad Muslims. Um, you know, like they're, they're, those stereotypes run deep and those things that we're, we're reared on are, they don't, we don't overcome them overnight. And so I, I dragged a lot of baggage into Iraq with me. The people were there for both of those things. You know, I, I found beautiful, hospitable people who, who helped me relinquish more of my fear and more of my stereotypes. Um, I definitely still found some some stereotypes to be true 
perhaps because I just went in expecting them to be true and was looking for them. Uh, but I think on balance, I would say Iraq was, was scary and beautiful and warm and kind and um, just much more multifaceted and multicolored and rich than, than we could have ever imagined before it became our home and they became our people. So from there, some big changes took place in in your mission, as in in your in in your way of beingness in the world. Who was Brother B, and how did he influence your life? Yeah, I, I was sitting in this hotel lobby, minding my own business, working on a humanitarian project that that I had become a part of, and the chai guy at this cafe had become like an acquaintance. I'd been there. It, would, it had become like my go-to spot uh, to go drag my laptop in and, and do my work at. I didn't know him at an intimate level, but we were very friendly. And um, one day he came and sat my tea down on the table and kind of hovered awkwardly over my shoulder a little too long, working up the courage to to ask me a favor. And he finally got the courage to say, you know, Jeremy, you've been coming here for a while now. Um, can I ask you a favor? And I said, sure, man, go ahead. And he said, well, I've got this cousin. She's about yay big now. And he held his hand up, you know, about six years off the ground, eight years off the ground. Um, she's about yay big now. But when she was born, she was born with this huge hole in her heart. And after all these decades of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship and war with Iran and U.S. sanctions against our country and now Al-Qaeda assassinating our doctors and nurses and airstrikes bombing out our hospitals. We, we don't have a hospital. We don't even have a surgeon left who can provide my cousin with the life-saving heart surgery that she would need to survive. You're an American. Uh, I know enough about you to know that you've come here to help us. So would you help us? I mean, our family. Would you help my family, my cousin? And um, fast forward, uh, I agreed to meet with the family. The cousin, dad, comes to the cafe a couple days later, and he brings his little girl with him to the cafe. And we have a, uh, you know, a, a logistical conversation is what I was expecting <laughs> about the, the ins and outs of congenital heart defect. And, you know, he's asking me to get his daughter out of the country for a life-saving heart surgery. I didn't know anything about that. And I tried to hold him off kind of at harm, arm's length and just say, man, I'm not your guy. I don't, I don't know how to do anything that you're asking for right now. But they were really humble and winsome. And rather than shame me for being an American occupier who you know, wants to live in the glow of humanitarianism, but doesn't actually do anything to help. They just kept humbly wooing me in and mm -hmm. essentially helping me see what might happen if I tried and succeeded on behalf of their child. Whereas I was looking at it through a, a lens of fear, what happens if I try and I fail? Um, they were saying, she's a dead girl walking to us. She's, she's about to die. What would happen if you tried and succeeded? And in many ways, they believed in me more than I believed in myself. They, they believed in the American story more than I believed in the American story. And um, they believed that the rugged individual could actually exert some agency over the world and maybe affect some change. And they unleashed in me as I, I decided to take their file and just kind of do some perfunctory calling around, we actually found some success for this little girl. We, we moved her down the line toward a heart surgery and kids just started coming out of the woodwork. Parents started coming out of the woodwork asking us to help their kids, showing up at our house, calling my private cell phone, um, and just finding their way to us against all odds, thrusting their little babies in our face. Um, asking us for help. And suddenly we became known as like, I, I became known as the bald American guy who helps kids get life-saving heart surgeries. And um, we were kind of off to the races without any design or, 
or plan. I'm going to dive more into this in a second, but you, you said there was an idea that came to you, which is love first and ask questions later. What was unfolding in me with this little girl who needed the life-saving heart surgery was a kind of new way of approaching the world rather than operate from a, not, and not that anything with regard to this family would have crossed one of the thou shalt nots that I was right, reared right, on, right. But, but it can just create an overall posture mm -hmm. of fear an overall posture of withholding, an overall posture of uh, let's play it really safe here. Mm -hmm. And um, what I felt just thrust into with her was a new way of being. What if we could love them all and let God sort it out <laughs> without, without trying to now be the arbiters of all things truth anymore, without without withholding something of ourselves because someone might not fully line up with what we think they ought to be or the world ought to be. What if we could give more liberally uh, with regard to our lives and our love? And she became a great place to start going all in on that philosophy. You, you mentioned Tolstoy earlier. I had somehow the book, uh, The Kingdom of God is Within You is, yes. is what it was called had had landed on my lap and it's it's basically Tolstoy's exploration of nonviolence and um Tolstoy a deeply spiritual person went on to inspire uh MLK and Gandhi and um and learned from them in some ways as well and it it was opening up to me in the middle of this war a new way of being and um essentially brought me to this point of saying there's got to be a better way than shoot first, ask questions later. What if we could love first, ask questions later? And um, with that question and all these kids that were coming to our door looking for life-saving surgeries in the wake of, of war, uh, we started our organization and we called it the Preemptive Love Coalition. Rather than a preemptive strike where I mm -hmm. get you before you get me, what if we could become a whole community of people around the world who seek to love you, maybe before you do anything to love me? Woohoo! It's a different way of living. It It is certainly, we had deer that found their way onto the deck a couple of days ago, and they actually <laughs> came up onto the deck and we're looking in the kitchen today. <laughs> and so my wife, Jessica, immediately threw herself on her back, belly up, to show there is nothing to be afraid of here. And the deer came right to the window and pressed its eyes and looked in. What a different way of living mm. If we show that side of ourselves instead, in fact, segueing from there, you say it was not enough to live at the front lines, but we must live at the front lines differently. And then I'm not sure if it was your decision or Jessica's again, but you were drawn to move to Fallujah. What was going on? Yeah, so we never we never moved our family into Fallujah, but we did um, we did work for years to get into Fallujah because it had essentially been ground zero for Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, Fallujah had become known as the bomb factory. It was, it was where bombs were made. It was where suicide bombers were made essentially. And they were sending them out into um, civilian markets and certainly into military convoys to try and drive back the American and coalition uh, efforts and to terrorize the civilian population. And in the U.S. government's and, and coalition's efforts to drive out al-Qaeda from its stranglehold that it had on Fallujah and the population of Fallujah, um, an approach was taken that, that essentially was kind of a scorched earth policy. And allegations started coming out, claims started coming out against the American government, the American military, uh, from both U.S. soldiers mm -hmm. and Iraqi civilians 
who were accusing the American military of using weapons that had created a massive increase in birth defects among the American military population and among the Iraqi civilian population. So you have American soldiers accusing their own military Mm -hmm. commanders of using, like what is going on in my body and what's going on in my family now that I'm discharged from this war, why are our progeny being born with birth defects? And, and these same exact claims were being made by the Fallujah residents who were still living in the place that was bombed out. And so it reached a level that you could not ignore it. We, we could not ignore it. And so we had worked for years to get into Fallujah. If this is ground zero of the birth defect crisis, then we have to figure out what is going on here. And um, we tried for years to get in, but it was too dangerous. No one would take us in. The American military wouldn't take us in. Um, Iraqi Muslim clerics wouldn't take us in. It was too dangerous. And then finally, one day, I got a call from the Fallujah medical community. And they were going to be hosting a special consult among all the Fallujah medical professionals where they were going to be working on trying to get their minds around what was happening with this massive, alleged massive rise in birth defects. And they snuck us in under the cover of night to come be a part of this conversation. And um, in photo after photo after photo of deceased children, they showed us some of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life of psychops babies and babies with their brains born outside their head and babies with elephant trunk noses and all kinds of other malformations skin diseases neural tube defects congenital heart defects that weren't visibly noticeable but but resulted in numerous child mortality mortalities um we I don't know what to say, except that we were drawn in deeper to, at once, uh, the, the darkness of what we can do to each other as humans and the light and beauty that we as humans are capable of in terms of continuing to forgive and open ourselves up to people who represent the other and who scare us and who can help us overcome the, the way the Fallujians embraced me mm-hmm. for all that they might otherwise say I represented yeah. as in a white American from the South evangelical, you know, kind of post evangelical, um, person. They, they really opened up their lives to me and allowed us to serve with them in a way that I think ultimately made a profound difference in, in all of our hearts. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. What happened? I'm going to fast forward the story a little bit, try to hit a couple. I don't even know if highlights is the right term. I would. I think the day-to-day love, to me, that is the highlight. But since we're talking about why end war, I, I want to talk about a few big things that happened. What happened when the genocide started? What was taking place? A lot of how we tell these stories... Um, it matters deeply where you insert yourself into the story and how you present, whether you present that to be step one or whether you present that to be sort of someone's reaction to a previous domino that had already fallen. Mm. And so I want to humbly acknowledge that ultimately we have to insert ourselves somewhere and start the story from somewhere. But there are, there are things that preceded this that are, that are worth discussing. Um, but in the, the late months of 2013 and the early months of 2014, we were headed into Fallujah yet again to, with a a life-saving medical team. And we got the call that you have to turn around. You can't come in, Mm -hmm. uh, where the the team's not going to be able to come in this time. The mayor was just assassinated and they were, the mayor was assassinated by a emerging group that most of us hadn't much heard of around the world that was called ISIS. ISIS went on to take over the city of Fallujah altogether, overrun a third of Syria, a third of Iraq, 
and in the summer of 2014 advanced on a very specific um, ethno-religious group of people called the Yazidi people um, who, are, who are worth all of us knowing well and exploring their story and their faith and their place of endangerment in this world. Let's, let's give them 30 seconds at least. I know that sounds horrible, but yeah. please give at yeah. least that. A, a unique um, ethno-religious group, meaning you cannot, you cannot become a Yazidi. You cannot convert to become a Yazidi. Um, spiritually, they represent a kind of offshoot of Zoroastrianism mm-hmm. and a kind of uh, syncretic amalgamation uh, a, a, as a survival um, adaptation, perhaps, um, accrued to themselves various aspects of Islam, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism, and, and other nearby faiths and religious expressions over over the centuries. Um, and though they would regard themselves as A, monotheists, mm-hmm. B, descendants of Adam and of the of the line of other Adamic and and arguably, I guess, even Abrahamic phase, yeah. they regard themselves as a people of the book, but their book was somehow um, gone into obscurity and they don't have the literal pages and texts with them today. They fall outside of the protections that other people of the book, like Jews and Christians, are ostensibly afforded Mm -hmm. in times of jihadic war when waged by groups like ISIS. Um, So if ISIS is being true to even a literalist reading of certain things, then there are certain things that they ought not do to the people of the book. And so Christians actually got a pass. Um, in the some of the ISIS onslaught of 2014. Um, but the Yazidis did not get a pass because they were not regarded as a people of the book. They were actually singled out and identified as people who could be raped and pillaged and kidnapped as and treated as the spoils of war. And so ISIS targeted them in a very horrific way. Um, kidnapped their girls, sent them into the worst kind of sexual slavery, uh, kidnapped their boys for brainwashing and conscription into the ISIS military apparatus. And um, sent millions of people, some of whom were Yazidi, hundreds of thousands of whom were Yazidi, uh, on the run for their lives. And so suddenly we were a small little surgery organization that had seen some great success all over Iraq and increasingly over the Middle East when ISIS onslaught drove people out of their homes. And suddenly we had millions of people filling up our streets in search of food, water, shelter, safety, medicine. And we were forced into a situation where we had to pivot as an organization to to provide the emergency support that they needed and, and try to stop the spread of violence. Um, if you leave traumatized people yes. living on the run for their lives, living in the desert, subject to the predations of militia and gangs and militant activists, uh, you pretty much ensure the spread of violence. These are, these are not neutral decisions to not care for refugees. They are dynamic decisions and represent more dominoes falling. So we, uh, we adopted a philosophy pretty quickly that responding quickly in times of violence actually stops the spread of violence from one person to another. As you, you love someone in their time of need, you, you help prevent their trauma from turning into an outward act of aggression whereby they might seek to secure food for their family by doing harm to another, uh, by engaging in criminal activity, by agreeing to go along with a gang um, just to put food on the table out of love for their own children. And so we began responding quickly uh, with emergency relief, uh, but soon realized relief alone is not gonna get us where we need to go. These people's lives have been decimated, their cities have been destroyed, 
And um, so we quickly started working on economic development and job creation, knowing that it's, it's economic stability and it's commerce and careful relationships with one another fostered through the marketplace and through relationship that that is actually going to help us end war. War doesn't break out in countries that are economically stable. Civil strife does not break out in countries where everyone has a job. And um, so, so now we see ourselves very much as a, a relief and a job creation community working to change the ideas that lead to war. Can you carry us forward in the timeline of 2014 to approximately today and Iraq? And I'm yeah. not sure if you want to go there, but I see a lot of repetition potentially going on now in the neighbor Iran. Yeah. Um, there's this idea, we're far from the first to say it, um, but, but we're not going to quit saying it over and over again, that there's this notion that um, peacemaking or peace efforts have been tried and found wanting um, I would dare say that we, we probably haven't even tried peace fully enough Thank you. yet. Um, and so what we find ourselves in right now is a very predictable cycle where we didn't invest heavily enough in the fundamentals. So we, here's, here's, I've been on the front lines as these bombs against ISIS and the like have fallen. I've been shot at by ISIS. Our, our teams have been shot at by ISIS. We've, we've been in intense conflict situations. Uh, we've, we've been in scary moments where we thought something might break loose and we could be kidnapped. Um, You're a miracle. Based on your book alone, you're a miracle standing. You are meant to be here. You're meant to be doing this work. There are too many opportunities where things could have gone the other way. Thanks. I, that's true even more for leaders on my team than it is for me. The, the, the greatest heroes on our team are, are usually not Westerners. They're local Iraqis, local Syrians, local Mexicans in our Mexico work, you yeah. know, and, and beyond. Um, the, here's what I've come to believe, having been on the front lines of some, when some of these bombs and bullets fly. We cannot bomb our way to peace. And so what we find ourselves in right now, whether you want to look at Syria, Iraq, Iran, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, North Korea, um, we, we have not worked on the fundamentals enough. So we drop bombs on the city of Mosul and then we move on. And then when the cycles of violence come back, we go, look, we told you they are inherently violent people. We knew it. We knew it all along. Their faith is inherently violent, by the way, as well. Um, when in fact, we, we just, you can't drop bombs on a people, leave them in squalor, and expect them to rebuild their lives in a pure upward climb out of the abyss without any, with any, out any kind of regression into a cycle of violence. Um, so are we descending back into violence in Iraq, uh, maybe in Iran today? Yes, I fear we might be. But, but it's not because we tried so hard to be at peace and, you know, the Iraqis just wouldn't have it or the Iranians just wouldn't have it. It's, it's that we dropped a bunch of bombs and basically moved on with our lives and left them all to pick up the pieces. And what is needed is a much more robust investment in diplomacy, a much more robust investment in economic development, and a more robust investment in peace, education, changing the ideas that lead to war, bringing people together across enemy lines, and realizing that th there's more to be gained in pursuing peace, a unity through our diversity rather than a pure flat landing of life and trying to act like we're all the same. We're not all the same. There, there are real differences to be celebrated here. And, and knowing our differences and celebrating our differences, that's what will make us strong.
not pretending that we don't see color or anything like that. that that's not going to get us where we need to go. You mentioned something interesting, and you talk about it toward the end of the book. You say enemy lines, and whether we call it a country border, whether it's about a wall, whether it's about a this and that, you say there's something wrong with our maps and our way. Mm. What do you mean by that? I think the story of the world is a story of continual unfolding. And these unfoldings, maybe there's some chicken eggness to be debated, but from my best understanding, um, at the very least, I think we can agree on a, a correlation between economic means of production and the kinds of society that they yield, and then the kinds of faith and spirituality that emerge simultaneously to that. So, for example, um, when all we have are hunter gatherer cultures mm -hmm. going out to gather berries and hunt small rabbits, and the only stories that we can tell consist of scraping berries on a cave wall to tell of our way of seeing the world, this is going to give rise to a certain kind of society. Uh, and there's not much of an economic means of trade or whatever. Yeah. When we move from that to something like an agricultural revolution and we get a, a, a printing press, for example, now our, our faith and our spirituality, our religion finds a new mode of expression. We can tell more robust stories. We can disseminate those stories globally. Uh, the way that we relate to each other because of an agrarian revolution, the way we store our food is going to give rise to a certain kind of humanity as we organize in different kinds of collectives and so on and so forth. As we move into an industrial age, that gives rise to an, a particularly industrial kind of religion. As we move into an information age, it gives rise to a certain kind of pluralism that we have not yet seen around the world. And what I think we're on the cusp of right now is – a movement into a new kind of economic engine. We are moving from something like an information age yeah. into an automation age. Yes. Um, AI, machine learning, there, things are going to be happening without us. And it's going to mark a, a transformational shift in humanity that is unlike anything we've ever seen before. And as AI, for example, gives rise to new economic realities. It will give rise. It is giving rise to new spiritual faith dimensions, and we are going to start relating to one another very differently. For each of these epochs or eras in human history, we've needed maps to help guide us through. But it has often been the case that our founding documents don't always translate well into new epochs, into new eras. And so we find ourselves trying to navigate the terrain that is actually beneath our feet today, the ground that we actually walk on. We often find ourselves trying to navigate it with outdated maps. Is the Constitution of the United States of America a map sufficient to guide us into the next 200 years? I have my suspicions that it will not stand up to what we are becoming. Is the Bible a sufficient enough map to be taken literally and only literally applied to the eras that we are in or the area in which we are going? I, I have my suspicions. And so I think what we find ourselves in need of is a way to hold the old maps and the new maps in harmony in kindness, honoring the past, honoring where we've been, honoring on whose shoulders we stand, honoring the ground that we've already walked, taking the best of all that it can teach us, and letting it launch us into the future as we are ever responsible for creating the new maps that actually match the terrain that we find ourselves navigating today. It's immensely com complicated. Um, and, and what we end up fighting over as much as anything are the maps not the terrain. I have this vision as we're going to AI, and, and you alluded to it toward the end of the book, of drone wars. 
Mm. Meaning the front lines even aren't being fought, at least one of the two sides may not be being fought with, God, it sounds awful, hand to hand, with you being able to see the other person, but rather as a video game. And there's this concept to me of a, at this point in our existence, we're the drones looking down, sort of like ISIS on a rooftop, not realizing there's a family beneath. And we're seeing this, like like whether we're looking at a constitution, a Bible, whatever, we're looking at a 2D image, a flat mm. image of the world. But this is, and I'm not saying this to make light of this, you, you talk about the most beautiful words a heart know is possible, and you talk about the answer being within, of coming full circle, the answer is diving in on the inside, on an individual basis, on a group basis, of seeing the richness within rather than just the topography that we think we're seeing on the surface. Mm. 100%. And I, honestly, it means so much to me that you, you got that. Um, and you've, you've picked up so much of of the nuance and the essence of what I was hoping to bring to the world with this book. And, um, to be honest, that hasn't been true of a lot of, uh, a lot of readers. And ironically, perhaps we find ourselves at the end of the, the final pages of the book. Yeah. And all some readers want to talk about is the scenes in which it seems to them like I've gone astray from the map that we used to share together. Um, and the, the larger and deeper conversation that I've been reaching for and the, the pointing to the future in an effort to be a helpful guide yeah. that I have been aspiring toward has, has seemed to get lost. I, I don't want to just debate the past. Um, and I don't think the book, though it recounts my past, the book is not about the past. The book is about how we change and how we can be kind to one another, and, and how we can all stick together, at, no matter the stage of life that we might be in, no matter the, the ways that we might be evolving, no matter what set of dogma we may be holding on to today or tomorrow. Um, so I, it means so much to me that you got the essence of that there at the end. Um, one of the things that I noted, I guess, in, in that final, one of those final scenes, I, I noted the time that our team got caught out behind enemy lines and there were literal fighters viewing our team in that kind of black and white imagery that they could see on their, their radar or their heat maps. And all they could see of us was moving heat signatures behind enemy lines. And so therefore we must have been ISIS. We must have been the bad guys. It couldn't be that we were helpers serving people in need. We had to be the bad guys themselves. And so they dropped bombs on our convoy, on our team and almost killed some of my dearest friends. And I, I use that at the end of the book to say, look, this is just how it goes. When, when we as people are committed to seeing the world topographically, as you say, whether that's through an Instagram post or a Twitter tweet or a dogmatic assertion, we will be inclined to bomb each other because when we see each other out in terrain that we imagine the other is not supposed to be in, um, we will be more prone to do harm to each other. And so if you will be the kind of person who loves anyway, that love will take you into enemy territory. It may take you to your past with people that you're not supposed to be hanging out with anymore because they're so regressive or bigoted or hateful. Or it may take you into a future that, you know, some people where you come from aren't ready for you to be living in that amount of light. Um, and so expect sniper fire, expect bombs from above. You will be misunderstood and people will take aim, but take heart because there are no victims on the other side of preemptive love. When, when you choose to live your life, giving your life away, no one can take it from you. 
I've done over 1,300 interviews, Jeremy. This is one of my all-time favorites. Well, thanks. Your message, what you're putting out to the world, how important it is for us to not understand, understand all here, to embody mm, this embody. Mm. is yep. critical. I, I am a believer. I am beyond a believer. I don't even know how to express the, the strength of conviction that if we get a critical mass of humanity, mm -hmm. everything positively shifts. Mm -hmm. This, what you're doing, the message that you're bringing, and the understanding on the front line are critical to that. Thanks. And I'm grateful for platforms that you provide and messengers like you who, who validate the, you know, with, with, with your own sense of like being a gatekeeper, um, validate what we've been experiencing on the front lines and saying, no, this, this lines up with the best of research and the, the best of, what you've experienced and heard over 1300 interviews, this stuff is applicable. I think that's the thing. That's, that's the side of the message that I want to bring. This is to be applied love, applied spirituality, um, not just for however important all the other things are. Uh, if we don't ultimately get up off our mat and go do uh, nothing will change. Couldn't agree more. So on that beautiful note, where can people go to get love anyway, to help out preemptive love and all places that you want to send people to? Yeah. So you can get the, get the book wherever books are sold. Yep. Um, loveanyway.com is, uh, probably the easiest to remember. You can get it on Amazon and all the various formats, um, including audio and Kindle. Um, the book is called Love Anyway. Loveanyway.com has the book. Um, also a 30-minute documentary that um, is not the same as the book, but covers some similar, uh, similar terrain. Maybe the one thing I would want to say here at this point is um, while I still live in Iraq with my family and while our organization and our work started in Iraq, uh, thanks to friends like you, Michael, and your listeners, the work has grown actually globally. So when we talk about how we exist to end war mm -hmm. and we talk about our efforts to, to stop the spread of violence and to protect vulnerable people from violence and change the ideas that lead to violence, um, that is a global effort that we are now um, able to, to be a part of. So we've got work in other global conflicts of going concern, including the immigration crisis across Central and South America. We've got work in Venezuela mm -hmm. this year, Colombia, Mexico, um, across the Middle East, in Syria, Iraq, and um, and beyond. So we'd just like to kind of situate our conversation while most of our talk here has been about the origin story and how we got started. Um, the, the essence of what we've been discussing, it works all over the world, including in your neighborhood, on the front lines where each of us listening to this right now live. And that's, that's really the heart of the book, is that, um, like you said, Michael, this be embodied uh, where we live. This isn't, this isn't someone else's job to go do for us. This is our job to do with our neighbors every day. So thank you. It does take place here. It also takes place with the work you're doing. So I've never put it quite this way before. I can hear a pastor or somebody saying this, but I want everybody to open their wallets up and support you because supporting you and supporting preemptive love is supporting each and every one of us and is making the world a safer, brighter, more peaceful existence for all of us. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people, Jeremy? I just appreciate that so much. We, we exist on the fuel and the love of monthly donors from around the world. And so... Um, it just means so much that you would, you would make that commendation to, to our friends listening all over. We can't do what we do for people in need. We can't change our own hearts without that kind of commitment. So thank you. We're committing to supporting you. And I hope everyone, if at all possible, I'm putting on my arms to surround all, all of our hundreds of thousands of listeners. If you can help in any way, this will help you, your kids, your grandkids more than you could ever possibly imagine. Totally agree. 
So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get love anyway, and begin loving first and asking questions later today and shine bright. Woohoo! Oh my God, Jeremy. Oh my God. Oh my God. Biggest man hug in the world. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. Thanks for the big love and big endorsement. That's so kind of you. I am almost without words at such a beautiful, life transformative, hopefully a planet transformative interview with Jeremy Courtney. Oh my God. To check out more incredible life-changing interviews, click here, subscribe below, be sure to click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows and of our YouTube lives with me, which are once a week, Tuesday evening, and of our premieres, which are every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday night. And be sure to leave your comments or questions below and support preemptive love. Love you guys. Shine bright.